our agenda for this morning. Uh, we have Tori Anderson who will be um, presenting from Norway uh, via Meet Echo. If you have something you'd like to hear Tori say, stand in the mic, otherwise we won't hear you. Um, <clears throat> then we've got Fernando Gaunt and uh, uh, Mark uh, Lukeback, Profit for IPv6, and a couple of uh, short presentations that uh, people basically want to want to get some guidance from the working group where to go to, with their documents. So before we get started, any agenda bashing changes people would like to make? Mab scurrying the back of the room. Okay. Uh, with that, Tori, are you online? Tori, tell me you're online. Oh, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, wonderful. Okay, uh, so I've been told that you need to control my slides because I won't be able to do it myself. Okay, okay. we got it. So um, what we've got is one deck for all three uh, documents. Sorry, ball's yours. Okay, so we can just hop on to the next slide, I guess. Um, I'll start by talking about the SIIT EAM uh, draft. And uh, that's a new draft. Uh, and uh, it's basically an extension to RFC 6145. To go to the next slide. Um, so what it does is that uh, it allows an um, operator of an SIIT implementation to override the default algorithm. And that's the algorithm in uh, 6052. Uh, and that uh, is the one that actually prepends or, sub, uh, or removes an IPv6 translation prefix from the IPv4 address. Uh, whereas the EAM algorithm, it allows you to add explicit mappings between any arbitrary IPv6 address and an IPv4 address. And um, the uh, EAM algorithm does not um, replace uh, RFC 6052. It's rather, uh, it's meant to, uh, to work in concert with it so that um, um, uh, if there is no mapping uh, added for a particular IP address, then uh, the implementation will fall back on the standard RFC 6052 mapping. Uh, so for a single packet might be translated uh, using both. With, for instance, the source address might be translated using an explicit address mapping, while a destination address might be used 6052. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the reason why um, for this draft, as in the use case or the problem statement, is that uh, the uh, standard SIIT mapping uh, requires that an IPv6 node that participates in the translation has to be numbered using IPv4 translatable addresses. And that's an um, operational hassle because um, it uh, requires that the limitations of IPv4 is imported into the IPv6 network in some way. Uh, for instance, you cannot use uh, as a stateless auto configuration if you want to use uh, SIIT because the, uh, the uh, IPv4 translatable addresses are not the same format as an address derived from the EUI64 uh, algorithm which is not a very nice thing from an operational point of view. Um, in any case, the operator would have uh, two choices. Basically, he can number his entire uh, IPv6 network using IPv4 translatable addresses. Uh, but that would mean that you don't have any more addresses in IPv6 available to you than you had in IPv4. So that kind of uh, takes away the point of IPv6, I would say. Uh, 
Another way to do it, which I have tried, is to number your IPv6 network any way you'd like, but then add uh, these IPv4 translatable addresses as uh, secondary addresses or loopback addresses on the hosts that you want to to um, be included in the translation uh, system. Uh, and that works, but it's uh, also an operational hassle because all of those addresses that are secondary to the native address needs to be routed throughout the whole IPv6 network. So you need to get a bunch of hosts routes, uh, essentially. Uh, and you need to uh, set up, if you have an ACL, ACL for the native uh, address of a service, then you would need to also set up an ACL for the IPv4 translatable uh, address of the service and so on and so on. So you need to double up with uh, monitoring and, and configuration and, and so on and so on. So basically you have ended up with kind of like a dual stack, even though you have only one actual stack, you have a mirror IPv6 stack that kind of mirrors your IPv4 connectivity. So, so basically IPv4 gets its, its the tendrils into your IPv6 network in a way that I would kind of rather avoid. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, I have found that there are um, already some use cases that are deployed. Uh, and uh, one of them is probably familiar to many of you, that's 464XLAT. Um, 464XLAT says that um, um, the CLAT in a uh, phone or uh, some device that implements 464XLAT should acquire a secondary uh, slash 64 and use that as a translation prefix per uh, RFC 6052. However, uh, in pr practically all uh, mobile networks in the world that have deployed IPv6, that is impossible because the handset will only get uh, a single slash 64. Uh, so it, you can't actually implement the recommended way of uh, doing 464XLAT uh, today. Uh, but the RFC um, gives you another option and that's to basically steal one of the addresses of um, out of that single primary slash 64 and then uh, do a one-to-one -one translation between that address and an IPv4 address of your choosing. Uh, and the drawing shows you how, uh, I believe, Android does it. What it does is it takes uh, the interface ID of uh, column, column 464. Uh, in all cases, it just steals that address because it knows it's not, it won't conflict with the primary address because that's an EUI64 address. And it also um, uh, always uses an IPv4 address of 192.0.0.4, which is from a um, special range uh, set aside for IPv4 to IPv6 translation. I forget the RFC, but uh, uh, I think it was actually a product of this working group. Um, so what you have in 464XLAT is this one-to-one -one mapping between that uh, column, column 464 address and the 192.0.0.4 address, which, uh, and the 464 address is not a IPv4 translatable address. So in order to implement this, uh, you need something extra on top of SIIT to, to do this CLAT function. Uh, and uh, with the EAM draft, you actually get a standardized way of doing this. Uh, because what you would add is this entry that you can see in the lower left corner, which is basically a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping uh, between these two addresses in question. Uh, and you could also take it one step further and uh, do a, another ad explicit address mapping between two prefixes, for instance, the smallest of the private address ranges and uh, slash 112. Uh, and then you also get a uh, explicit one-to-one -one mapping between all the addresses in those prefixes specifically. And that would also, that would allow, for instance, for a tethering function to be done in a completely stateless way in the device. I don't think that Android does this today, but at least it's there as a possibility. 
uh, and that would mean that the tethered host would only go through one stateful NAT instead of two, uh, which is common today. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other um, use case that I found that has already been documented is IVI. Um, IVI is a bit, um, I don't exactly know why they have done it this way, but IVI is very much like SIIT, like the pure SIIT, only that they have chosen a specific prefix format that is different uh, from that of uh, that is in um, RFC 6052. So they put the 32 IPv4 bits in a different location, so it's incompatible with a standard SIIT. I don't exactly know why, but there it is. Um, but uh, with, since those 32 bits are contiguous in the IPv6 address, uh, you can do this with an uh, explicit address mapping as well. So you would actually do a mapping between the whole IPv4 address space and that 40 bits prefix. Uh, that is the IVI translation prefix. So. Um, if you have an um, SIIT implementation with, that supports the explicit address mapping graph and you want to do IVI, then you have everything you need. Um, but as, as with X forces for XLAS, you cannot do this with, with um, uh, plain SIIT. Next slide, please. Um, and that's uh, my draft, uh, the S SIIT data center draft. Um, which I'm going to talk about in a few moments more closely. So you should uh, probably pay extra attention here because I want to be going through this again. Um, the um, SIIT DC draft uh, allows you to, uh, or describes how you could um, build a data center network or really any IPv6 network, but I'm focusing on the data center use case. And uh, you number it however way you like and use whatever techniques you like. So you can use whatever is fancy these days, like segment routing or Lisp or, or as a um, stateless auto configuration or whatever. And then uh, when you're done doing so without thinking one bit about IPv4, then you can add mappings between whatever public IPv4 addresses you have and the devices in your IPv6 network that needs to respond to um, uh, connections from the internet. So basically, uh, if you see the um, probably a web server that's up to the left in the IPv6 cloud, uh, it has an colon colon AT address, which is what IPv6 as a native IPv6 clients will connect to. And then I add an explicit address mapping that uh, a maps up the dot four IPv4 address from that pool so that uh, IPv4 clients can connect to it using that particular address. And that uh, also does not require any particular uh, format of the IPv6 addresses. That's kind of the key point. You don't need the IPv4 translatable addresses. And again, in order to do this, you need to have this uh, a stateless translator that goes beyond uh, RFC 6145. Um, so that's basically what uh, the data center draft is all about and also basically what the explicit address mapping is all about. Um, so next slide, please. Um, all of this is already uh, been adopted by this working group in the SIIT data center draft. Because uh, that has a section that basically tries to standardize this uh, explicit address mapping behavior. Um, well, but in Honolulu, Dave Thaler uh, gave me a comment on the mic and he said that, uh, or at least according to the minutes, he said that uh, this isn't a new protocol, it's just, just a use case description. Um, and uh, I disagree with that because, as I've said before, or earlier today, is that um, um, you need 
to have a way to deal with non-IPv4 translatable IPv6 addresses in order to make it work. And that's not in the protocol, ergo, this is a new protocol or it's an extension uh, to the existing protocol. Um, however, uh, his comments had me thinking about um, what is actually the use case part of it there that I'm trying to do, the data center stuff, and what is the um, uh, protocol stuff, which is these explicit address mappings between uh, IPv4 and IPv6 addresses. And um, I realized that it's not, or the functionality, uh, the protocol functionality is probably useful beyond the data center use case that I'm working on. And uh, in particular, our case in point, the uh, 464XLAT and the IVI uh, uh, use cases. Um, so I'm thinking that it was probably not a good idea to put the protocol stuff in the data center draft. Um, but uh, I think it would be better to have it in a separate draft and then the data center use case can just build on that. Um, so that's what I'm going to do now is to ask uh, if the working group will adopt this draft as a working group document, because uh, that would uh, allow me to basically take the same stuff out of the data center draft and, and move that draft forward as a um, as a non-proposed standard document, and then uh, keep the, the protocol update in a proposed standard document, which would be this draft. So I don't know if you want to um, um, do all of this at the end, or if you want to do it now, uh, Lee and Fred, you have to chime in on that. Yeah, I, um, I think we, you may probably want to have, let's go ahead and continue. I do think we wanted to definitely give people a chance to ask questions, make comments, That's up, but it's up to you whether you want to take questions on this, just this part now, or you want to move on and do the whole, th do all three of them together. Mm, we can take the questions now if there's any. Any questions or comments specifically on the AAM draft that he was just describing? Eric Klein, can you hear me, Tor? I can hear you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> do you, how do you see communicating the, um, the EAMT, so the, the EAM table specification to clients? If they need to learn, um, in the case of course, for XLAT, the client needs to learn, it has a very simple mechanism to learn what the translation is, right? This allows for many more special cases on top of that. I, I fear I fear the uh, coming of a DHPP6 option. Yeah, uh, so for uh, 464 XLAT, as you said, that's already in the 464 XLAT document, so there is no need to specify that further. Uh, I guess you use uh, DNS64 prefix discovery and then, and then you just configure basically a static uh, interface face identifier and a static IPv4 address and then you're good to go. Uh, for now, I don't uh, specify a method of, uh, another method of uh, discovering this, for instance, for the data center draft. Uh, in the data center use case, I basically assume manual configuration. Um, um, I saw that there is already, as you <laughs> quite correctly uh, were worried about, uh, a draft about uh, a DHCP v6 option to discover uh, NAT64 prefixes. Uh, so I spoke to the authors of that and saying that you might you might want to consider uh, making that a uh, generic type of translation prefix uh, draft. And so you basically add the type uh, parameter to the prefix. That would allow them to uh, to use that option to communicate both stateful NAT64 prefixes, which is already the draft documents, or stateless uh, um, uh, 6145 prefixes, or explicit address mappings, because all of them are basically you know, prefix, IPv6 prefix and IPv4 prefix coupled together. Yeah, not a specific concern, just a question. Thank you. So this is uh, just my con. Hey, Taylor. Uh, so I came into the presentation uh, way through, so I missed the earlier part, but uh, I just wanted to comment. 
uh, mentioned me on the slide, um, that I do agree with your eventual conclusion that splitting it into uh, two documents, one that um, covers, you know, updating and, and non ip 4 embedded ip 6 addresses and separating that from the data center use cases. So I just wanted to say that I support your final conclusion. Um, I don't have any comments or questions about the technical aspects of that because I missed that part of the presentation. Sorry, but I uh, just wanted to get up and support your final conclusion. Thank you. Uh, Lorenzo Colidi. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, for, first, for what it's worth, uh, Android 464 it's like, doesn't use colon colon 464 anymore. Um, it uh, generates a checksum neutral address randomly. Uh, but um, it's, this, it's the problem is the same. Uh, I, in order to address Eric's concern, I think that if uh, if we call this something, then there will be, you know, then yes, we will have, you know, ways to deploy it and DHP options for it and so on. Instead, what we could do is just uh, call this, you know, an update to 6052 saying that there are transmission mechanisms that um, use non-translatable addresses uh, in as part of how they work and just say that that's okay. An update to 6052. Well, that's that's the which is the address format. Well, the, the update to whatever RFC has the has the text that says, you know, six one four. Uh, sorry, um, whatever RFC has the text. This is how NAT stateless NAT four and NAT four six needs to work. Sorry, NAT four. Uh, so that's okay. not sixty fifty two. Is it six one four five? Six one four five defines the translation, and it uses six fifty two for the address format. Right. All I'm saying is, we just need to say it's okay not to use this address format for six one four five style translation. And there are, in fact, mechanisms to do it without defining something in full city. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I would argue that it's actually sixty one forty six. Sixty one forty five has no table. Uh, 6146 has a table and states that you can manually that it can. Yeah, I'm a, uh, I would say that Christian Wittema at Microsoft, uh, I'm actually one of the authors of CC52, and it was never meant to be the only format ever used. I mean, it's a, it's a format that is mostly meant to make sure that if you have an IPv4 network and you translate it, when you translate it back, you get the same thing. That was the, the real goal. Okay, but it's not meant to. Uh, of course, if you have a V6 network and you translate to V4, it's impossible to always guarantee to get the same thing. It's because on some state or tables or so. And we know that and we, we should not make it up. So, um, so let's, let me just respond to Lorenzo's comment. Um, there is one uh, one existing update of uh, 6145 already. Uh, I think that also is a product of this working group. It's RFC uh, 6791, and that deals specifically with what happens when a stateless translator receives a um, a uh, an ICMP v6 error from an IPv6 ICM, IPv6 router that does not have a, a, a IPv4 translatable uh, address. And that RFC says that, okay, the, the um, stateless translator can be configured with a pool of IPv4 addresses and just pick one at random from that pool in order to be able to translate that error back into IPv4. Uh, so there is already a precedent for, up, for, an, for updating RFC uh, 6145 in order to overcome uh, the uh, limitation of uh, 6052 with regards to requiring IP4 translatable addresses. Uh, so I, I think that this draft tries to update uh, the, the right RFC uh, by, no, no, by updating. I, I do agree with you. I, I do agree with you. I, I think we should do this. I just don't want it to call, I don't want to call it anything. Okay, I want to call it an update to 6145. I don't want to define something new called SIITEM, which means that you know there's a, it's a feature. It's there's DHP options for it. There's deployment guides for it. We just say, look, you know, six one four five specified in address format. It turns out that there are multiple ways that you can use stateless um, translation 
without using that address format. Here are three examples. The restriction that you must use this address format if there ever was such restriction is hereby struck from the record, period. Right, and uh, I think that uh, actually that's already the case because an SIIT-EAM, that's just uh, kind of a shortcut for the draft itself. Uh, it's not meant to be a separate standard. And I think the title of the, as in the title of the draft is explicit address mapping for SIIT. Uh, and I think I used that throughout the draft, but I'll double check to make sure that I'm actually not calling it something else because I agree with you. So I think we're in violent agreement here. Other comments, uh, questions about the yeah. AM? Okay. Let's move ahead then to to your DC. All right. Uh, so next slide, uh, or basically up another uh, slide. Also, go to the status title slide. Um, Sorry, we're, we're trying to advance the slide. Uh, excuse me. Trying to advance the slide here in the room. Uh, technical. Oh, it doesn't work. Oh, okay. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, I'll get that to you. Did you hear that? Okay. Um, right. So um, uh, the the data center drafts. Uh, basically, there has been very little changes. There's some some very small. There's been one new version, and uh, since Honolulu. And uh, uh, it's basically to update the the, um, uh, the file name uh, so that it reflects that it uh, was adopted, which it was. Uh, but uh, other than that, I have basically not done anything with it because the future direction it would take would will depend on whether or not the working group uh, agrees that the explicit address mapping stuff should be ripped out and put in a separate document or not. Um, so I'm kind of waiting for that. Um, other, so basically that's the latest status on the data center draft. Um, I don't know if there's any questions about this. That's basically everything I had about that particular draft. I don't see anybody running this mic. Okay, let's move on then. Um, so this is on the companion draft that was also adopted in Honolulu. Uh, next slide. Uh, it's about dual translation. And uh, uh, if you're familiar with how 464xlat works, it's uh, very similar. It's almost a ripoff, uh, but it's for a different um, use case. It's uh, for the data center use case where you have Either you have a server, uh, which supports IPv6 fine, but it needs to run some application which requires IPv4, uh, or you have some sort of server or device that does not support IPv6, and you want to have a IPv6 network in your data center uh, as an IPv6-only network, not a dual-stack network, but still you will need want to uh, support these IPv4 devices uh, at the edge of the network. Um, so, if SIIT DC is comparable with, uh, for the data center use case, is comparable with NAT, stateful NAT46 in the uh, ISP use case, then uh, the uh, double translation draft is comparable to the 464xlat uh, use case. So, they are very kind of mirror images. Um, so, um, yeah, and I also mentioned that in addition to supporting IPv4 only devices or uh, pieces of software, you can also use a double translation to deal with uh, application protocols that do not uh, tolerate address translation well, like, uh, say, FTP or even encrypted FTP. Uh, because uh, you reverse the translations uh, done by the outer translator in the host or right outside of the host so that the IPv4 addresses are end-to-end -end transparent, they're the same. Um, so no rewriting is going on or 
actually they are rewriting, but it's being rewritten back to its original state. Uh, so uh, it works with yeah, encrypted FTP, for instance. Uh, I can uh, go through it more specifically. Next slide. Um, and this is the um, host-centric translation, uh, as I call it. And that's when you have the translator running inside of the server or IPv6 only device. Um, so uh, it's if the like use this if the um, software does not support IPv6 sockets at all, or that the protocol it runs do not support uh, address translation. Um, so that gives, as you can see on the slide, the, um, the FTP uh, software gets an INET6 socket natively, and in addition, it gets an uh, IPv4 INET socket. And uh, on that uh, socket, it will actually see the outside public IPv4 address. And what's required for this to work is to uh, configure the same explicit address mapping in the uh, host-based uh, translator um, as you do in the outer translator that's in the data center network border. Um, and there is not currently any me uh, defined mechanism for how that mapping is communicated uh, through the uh, to the server's uh, translator. So um, for now, assuming that that would be statically configured or that future work will uh, declare some way of doing it. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is uh, what's new since Honolulu. Uh, it was a suggestion from, uh, from uh, Ray Hunter, I believe, to actually take the um, uh, host-based translator and put it outside of the host. Uh, and that would allow you to um, support IPv4 only devices or servers. Um, so the concept is the same, only that uh, instead of uh, assigning the translated address to a local interface, uh, it will be routed out a physical interface to some network segment, and then uh, on that network segment, you can then locate IPv4 only devices. Uh, that translator device could include an DHCP v4 server, for instance, to configure the, uh, uh, the IPv4 only device, but um, I don't try to, try to define how that must be done necessarily, because there is plenty of options there. Um, and you can take the next slide. Uh, yes, and that's just to illustrate that it doesn't necessarily mean that it's IPv4 only, um, the device behind this translator. It can be also be dual stacked, um, which is useful if the server might support IPv6 just fine, but it does not have an implementation of this translator uh, available. Uh, so if you have, say, a iSCSI storage array, um, uh, chances are you won't be able to install software on it, so it probably won't support the on-host translator, and then you can use this to actually um, give it a dual-stacked um, connectivity. And uh, there is plenty of ways to do this. The, the translator sitting um, in between there, it can either be kind of on a stick, so it basically dual stacks the same network segment as provides the IPv6 only uh, connectivity, or it can provide a separate IPv4 connection, or it can even basically be like an intelligent patch cable that bridges IPv6 traffic but translates IPv4 traffic in the on the server side. So uh, there's plenty of possibilities here. In any case, the basic concept is the same. It undoes the, the translations done between the IPv4 internet and the IPv6 only data center network and provides the seemingly native IPv4 connectivity to the server. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, 
Yeah, so like the network mode is new, as uh, I mentioned. And um, in the previous draft, I called uh, the translator a host agent. And that didn't make much sense anymore, considering that it can be outside the host. So I uh, renamed this to the edge translator instead. Um, and then there's also a section about uh, how to communicate between these IPv4 only devices inside a data center. Um, so that's thanks to Andrew and, and Will Liu for coming up with some uh, offer, prompted me to do so. Um, that was basically what I had to present about this draft. Uh, there is a question I'm wondering about, and that's whether or not these two drafts should be separate. I kind of started out uh, like that because that's how the use case ideas kind of built uh, in my in my head. I started out with single translation, and I, that worked fine. And then after a while, I wanted to see how I can you know, make, for instance, FTP work through this. And uh, so then it's a separate draft. Uh, and kind of the same thing happens with the mirror image of Stateful NAT64 and 464XLAT. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, Stateful NAT64 was already published by the time 464XLAT was conceived. So, so maybe it's not a fair comparison to say that because those are separate, this should be separate. So. Uh, comments on that would be, I would appreciate that. Um, next slide. Uh, and that's, I, um, well, I, I know that this this uh, group of people uh, like uh, running code and rough consensus. So at least I'll try to point out that there is plenty of running code, uh, both from commercial vendors and open source implementations. Uh, they don't all uh, implement every little bit of it, but um, um, I think, for instance, Joule is pretty feature complete uh, with regards to the uh, EAM and the SIITDC drafts. Um, so, well, if if you want to actually try it out, uh, it's quite possible. So, and then the next slide, last slide. Um, I'd really love to have more input and uh, reviews or uh, comments. So as you can see on the slide, I'm offering a bribe to anybody who wants to <laughs> wants to help me out with that. You can pick it up at in Prague. I'll be there, I hope. Um, and that's that's about it. Um, questions, comments, feedback. Now is the time. Okay. Okay, Thank so you. I've got two questions. Um, one, uh, I understand that Paul Saab is to help you uh, or to work with you on these, is that correct? I've been discussing it with Paul, yes. Uh, he hasn't committed to to it yet. Uh, I guess he's a busy man, but, uh, but uh, we'll see if that happens or not. Okay. And so this uh, host, or I'm sorry, network-centric mode, how does that differ from uh, software's uh, this does not uh, do any overloading of ports uh, or uh, oversubscription of IPv4 addresses. So it's a one-to-one -one mapping between an IPv6 address and an IPv4 address. And the, uh, so it's kind of it's a much simpler standard uh, than MAPT because it does not touch the layer 4 payload at all except to recalculate checksums. Um, and the reason for uh, why I thought that I could leave such things out uh, is that in the data center environment, you kind of you need those low numbered ports, which map T exclude, uh, or, and also you probably need the same port over and over again. So uh, even though you can have <laughs> yeah 65,000 ports on an IP4 address, if all of your users, which is in this case, you know, servers or load balancers or whatever, need port 80 to the, for themselves, then you can't really multiplex anyway. So then it's, it gets easier if you just don't worry about that kind of functionality at all. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions in the room?
Um, or I understand we have some remote participants in various other places. Um, any other things from the ether? Hearing none. Um, so we do have a question before the working group. Um, do we want to adopt EAM as a draft, as a working group draft, and do the change that Tori suggested to uh, to the basic DC draft, or do we simply want to leave the algorithm in the DC draft? Um, those that would be interested in adopting EAM, uh, please hum. Those that would rather not, uh, please hum. Okay, I don't hear any. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's the only real question for the working group at this point. So thank you, Tori. Uh, there was one more, one more question. And that's uh, whether or not I should merge the single and double translation data center drafts or if I should keep them separate like NAT64 and 464X like this? Well, let me ask you a question. Um, how much work would that be? Would that be basically concatenating the two drafts into one, or is that is the surgery involved? Uh, there is not m that much surgery, I think. Um, most of them would be actually just putting them in place. And I, I noticed that I, I ended up um, uh, referring a lot back and forth, uh, which kind of gets a bit odd. So then uh, I would have to kind of remove those parts as well. But um, I don't think it will be that much work. Um, okay, given that, what what would be the size of the resulting draft? Is this now 20 pages become 500? Or uh, what are we talking about in terms of size? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I can't remember exactly how many pages they are. So. Yeah, but roughly equivalent then to concatenating the two documents. Um. So how many pages were uh, both of them together? You I, say? I, I'd have to go look at that. I, <laughs> um, uh, me too. But of course, that would be the, the aggregate would be smaller than the the two combined. Obviously, um, for the simple reason that there's lots of, you know, disclaimer text and stuff like that, and lots of references which are duplicated. So um, it would they would be smaller in total okay. than separate. Lorenzo. Uh, yeah. So I have no objection to S I T E M being a separate document. Um, I just can we just call it an update of six one four five that clarifies it without. Is. It is. But can we not call it something? I don't want to. I don't want to define a new. You know, we just want to. Yeah, I don't know. Relaxing the IP addressing requirements of six one four five. I don't know what we call it. Just as long as it doesn't have a name that that implies that this is a new protocol or a new transmission mechanism or a new something. Yeah. Um. So so about the draft. Uh, it calls a mapping, an explicit address mapping, and it calls. So, um, so, so I would do it this way. I would I would have one document that says, the the limitation that six one four five translation must use this type of addresses is hereby struck from the record. It's gone. That draft up formally update six one four five, and then I would leave the explicit mapping as an unnamed implementation detail of the DC draft. If you can, that you know. because otherwise right, so that, it comes around with some new way to to use a different type that's different from EAM. We have to go through all this again and say, ah, we've already defined three type three ways which we can use non-translatable addresses in six one four five. Here's the fourth one. Okay, but if you say that it is in fact a static mapping from six one four six. That's already in 6146. We've achieved your goal. Then, then why do we need this document? Well, this is a conversation I had before you. Really from 6145. 
Okay, so, so you're saying that we don't need this document? <laughs> I'm confused. This is a conversation that Tori and I have had. Um, Tori, maybe you want to state your side of it. Yeah, uh, so 6146, which is the stateful NAS64 document, um, that defines a stateful solution. It says you need uh, session tables, you need this. What to me in email was that 6146 talks a lot about ports and, um, and that you simply wanted to change the address as opposed to messing with the port. Um, yes, exactly. Okay. And my observation, yeah, the counter observation is that 6146 has a table and 6145 doesn't. Uh, this, this requires a table. So it's, it's not really fish or fowl. Uh, we could call it an update to both of them. But the point is that you can do something that doesn't involve a port and you can have a static map. Yes, and I want to say that if I, to, if you de, um, implement this, um, you don't need to implement uh, the session tables and the binding information basis and uh, all of that stuff that's in uh, in uh, 6146. Uh, so basically, I want 6145, but with this additional. Um, uh, possibility to override the 6052 um, algorithm. And that's, like I said, that's basically what already forces for x that and IVI is doing already. So now I'm trying to actually define how that uh, should work so that if a future implementation of SIT comes along that, implement, that implements this update, then you can immediately take that implementation and um, and build a forces for XLAT CLAT, for instance, or a uh, SIIT data center translator or an IVI translator. So basically, it, it uh, makes the basic building block that is SIIT a bit more versatile than it currently is. So, so basically, your question, Ritema, your use case basically is that if you have few enough IPv4 addresses to cover all your v6 host. You can put some kind of a static mapping table for the v6 host to IPv4 address and you don't need to mess up with port numbers. So basically you are doing an intermediate variant between static and, uh, and stateful. And while well, there's certainly a use case for that, but I mean it's kind of a uh, um, the, the particular use case in the data center uh, environment is that um, uh, you typically have a lot of servers in a data center that uh, do not, uh, yes. And if you have a million, uh, yeah. So uh, not all of those probably are accessible from the internet. They might be some sort of backend server or file server, database servers you name it, and uh, you might only have, say, a dozen uh, devices or servers, could be load balancers, and et cetera, that's available from the public internet over both IPv6 and IPv4. Wow. So uh, what, what uh, I want to do is to have uh, the scaling properties of IPv6 only for all of these millions of servers, if I have, and uh, and then for those few that needs to be accessible from the internet, uh, like the web server or the load balancer, those few I want to be able to uh, give this static mapping to, and make them available from the IPv4 internet that way. Okay, Christian. No, okay. So, I mean, basically, for me, it's a clear use case of intermediate between static translation and set full translation and which because the, the stat is constrained to be small you can put it in a static table that's, that's what it is. okay thank you so um, 
unless somebody disagrees with me, that this seems like a, a great opportunity for conservation of work. Um, it, it seems like uh, you, you should finish up the DC draft, uh, so, so that separating the EAM from the DC draft uh, will adopt EAM. And uh, then we're, what we're looking for is uh, further experience with the technology. Uh, and, and then we'll, we want to send it off to the ISG. Um, so con reviews and, and hopefully implementations. Um, is, is that your perception for you, of where things need to be? Yes, that sounds good. Um, okay. So let me ask the working group. Uh, and we will obviously vet this on the list, but uh, does, does anybody have a problem with what I just said? And I, I see nobody having their heads explode. So, okay, thank you, Tori, very much. Thank you. Morning. Uh, my name is Fernando Gom, and I will be presenting the idea of observations on IPv6 extension header filtering in the real world. Uh, this is a document that was uh, presented, if I recall correctly, for the first time at the um, um, ATS at D6 Ops meeting in Honolulu. Uh, as a kind of problem statement, uh, it was known that packets that contain IPv6 extension headers are dropped re or result in packet drops in a number of um, scenarios. And we feel that there is awareness needed in this area. Uh, first of all, that such packet drops actually occur, but then there's other information, other, other information uh, that is valuable, such as you know what's the packet drop rate, uh, where in the network those packet drops occur, etc. Uh, what's the goal of our internet draft? Uh, first of all, agree on a problem statement. Uh, provide real-world data um, regarding the extent to which those packet drops occur and where in the network those packet drops occur. Uh, this document also documents the measurement process so that the community can help, you know, with producing uh, more results. And the document also contains a section uh, providing help on how to isolate problems um, uh, arising from the, uh, the dropping of packets that contain uh, IPv6 extension headers. Uh, this is the change log from the last version of this ID. At the Honolulu meeting, essentially the comments that we got was that, um, as far as I recall, that the working group was interested in a document that would provide uh, real world data. At the time, the previous version of this ID had other sections. For example, it was discussing the, uh, the security and performance implications of extension headers and based on the working group feedback we removed that section uh, we also had a section with recommendations on what to do in this area and based again on the feedback that we received from the working group that section was removed and also at the time in the previous uh, version of this id uh, the measurement process was not like fully documented so what we did in this uh, revision is essentially uh, fully document the measurement process, even provide like a you know, step-by-step -step instruction on how we did these measurements so that uh, if anyone wants to reproduce them or uh, just to double check or provide more data, uh, you can do it. And of course, we also incorporated a number of miscellaneous edits and, and clarifications. Good. Okay. Um, I don't know if uh, there are any uh, comments. So basically on our perspective, what we did for this version of DID is what the uh, working group had suggested. So from my perspective, this version of the really for, uh, for the working group to decide whether to adopt or not. A question for you, uh, this is Lee Howard. Do you have, uh, have you spoken with uh, operators on whose networks you've noticed problems with extension? Yeah. Uh, well, with some of them, they, and some of them are actually in this meeting, they uh, explicitly uh, drop packets with extension headers for a number of reasons. Uh, and what I did, but didn't contact uh, them, um, 
I modify the tools that we use for the measurements so that the tools would output the autonomous systems that were dropping the packets. Uh, what I did so far was just you know, post the list on BSIXOPS, uh, just as a heads up to the, to the group, but I didn't contact myself, those, those uh, uh, providers, no. Uh, in any case, uh, well, that's one of the reasons for which I personally think that you know, the section that, that we had on, on, the, on the analysis of security and, and performance implications, uh, that was valuable from my perspective. Uh, that section was like a superset of the document that this working group uh, had at the time on why operators filter fragments. So I guess in some cases that might, those might be some of the reasons, but obviously I, I cannot speak for them. Mikhail, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back. Uh, Fred Templin from Boeing. Uh, so does this document apply only to extension headers in the real IPv6 internet or also in private networks, private IPv6 networks? Uh, it applies to systems that are yeah. publicly reachable from the internet. The measurements that we did is with public uh, internet servers. We got the list from Alexa's top one million sites. And from that list, we obtained the list of web servers, name servers, and uh, name servers. And the same, yeah. we did the same thing for the, from the list of uh, nodes from the world IPv6 lan chain. So yes, it doesn't apply to private networks. Okay, so like in a private network, it should be okay to use extension headers as long as all the network equipment is, is honoring them. I cannot speak for that. I mean, okay. I can speak for what I measure, but uh, I didn't measure like private networks and actually since they are private, I wouldn't be able to measure sure. it. Okay. But I would expect that that's, that's the case or it's actually, or at least it's uh, the number should be, or I would expect them to be completely different from what we got here, yes. Michael. Uh, Michael Abramson. So uh, uh, as I've said uh, a couple of times before, and I don't know if we've discussed this, um, for me, filtering is intent. Um, and to talk about ISPs filtering extension headers and filtering fragments and so on means that they are doing this on purpose. There are a lot of people who are not doing this on purpose. They are not aware that this is being done. Um, I would like to see a different terminology with the drop and so on. Am I'm, so I'm not a native Eng English speaker. Is filtering, is there an intent in that or not? Or is it, I'm just misinterpreting it. An intent in what? Okay, so if, someone, if I'm filtering something, yeah. this is a conscious decision I have made that I am now going to not forward these packets. No, what we are just saying is that the packets are being dropped. Whether yes, so why are we not? saying that they're being filtered and not that they're being dropped? Filtering is to selectively drop something that doesn't exist. Yes, and, and then it doesn't. That's my intent. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know. So, because for, for me, well, when I hear filtering, I hear bad ISPs, evil, you know, they want to no. you know, break the internet. No, actually, when I posted that list, I made it clear that for me it wasn't like a wall of shame okay. as someone were implying. There's no actually uh, discussion of intent here, and I'm not even, we are not even taking a stance in the idea that, that you know, whether they have valid reasons or not. Well, I think Michael has a valid point, though. If the, if the transit domain, if an ISP other than the final load balancer or whatever uh, is even looking past the routing header. It's looking at something it was never intended to look at and which it's told not to look at. Um, so if it's <laughs> looking there, that's by intent. That's your point. Uh, so, so it could be that there is an intent, there is a choice made by the, by the vendor who has set a certain default wh where, which, of which the ISP is not aware of. Um, I mean, this is a, uh, it could be a silly discussion, but it's, it's just that when I hear filtering fragments, I hear that they are doing this on purpose. And I can tell you that there is a bunch of them who are not. Well, we are not yeah. implying in things. So if you have like any, you know, alternative yes. wording for that, I mean, I'd be happy to update that. Yeah, so I, I prefer drop, oh, oh, but okay. if I- so, so, so let me throw a middle ground in there, uh, looking at it from the perspective of a vendor. Um, if I have an ACL, that requires me to look at the TCP header. I have to parse the IP header to find the TCP header. And if I run into something I don't understand, I could imagine that, that I don't know what to do with it. Okay, and I'm, I'm not giving you a case, but you know, hypothetically, yeah. I could imagine that. The, 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 there are <clears throat> platforms out there that by default, for instance, drop uh, or slow path fragments. And this is just the default setting and there is nothing in, the, I mean, you have to look hard to find this. And that's just the way it is. So some of the fragments being dropped is because this device is being used in its default settings and the ISP is not aware that this is going on. 
Okay, so we do have equipment that has that as a default setting. And that's that's yes. what you just said. That's what I just said. So part of the fragment breakage that people say here keep calling filtering is done completely unintentionally by the ISPs that are using this equipment in some cases, or in a wide number of cases, I would say. Okay. So, so okay, so I'll just, okay, the Cisco 7600 and 6500 of, you know, RSP 720 and SOUP 720 comes to fall out of the box, slow pathing fragments, period. This is just the default setting. You need to change the setting if you want to do this uh, in, in fast path. These are quite widely used, and I'm sure most people who are now exhibiting this behavior have no idea about this. Well, you know, part of the goal that... No, but slow path is 10 megabits per second. So, so, so basically, if you're running 10 gigs, this is basically you're going to drop it. Um, because, uh, I mean, we saw this, we were running a lot of 64 traffic and so on. There were a lot of fragments in there, huge amounts of fragments. Like we were, we were dropping hundreds of megabits per second of fragments without knowing it. Well, one of the goals of you know, this idea is for that discussion to happen. Yes, and I think it's a very valuable discussion to have, but it's just, when I hear you know, someone saying ISPs are filtering fragments, I hear bad ISP, you've made a conscious decision and you should stop doing that. No bad behavior, intentional or unintentional. Okay, I need you guys to go to the mic because we can't hear you. The word filtering and intent, neither of them, filtering and drop, neither of them conveys intent to me. That's all. Okay, if I'm the only one who has, makes this difference, then I'll shut up and go away. I just wanted to raise the issue. Uh, with, this is Lee Howard. Without my chair hat, I, I hear the same uh, nuance. Um, the selective dropping of packets means there's a selection going on. Um, that's how I hear it. This is probably good future conversation. So, uh, Ole Tran, um, I have two points. Uh, so, one that I partly made on the mailing list that I think you should make a much clearer separation. So, well, so I have concerns with methodology here, right? That, you know, one part here you're measuring um, essentially load balancer policy or, you know, site firewall policy. And that to me isn't so interesting because that, that is going to, you know, we're, we're never going to convince. Uh, well, they know their service and they're going to filter the packets today. And that's with intent and it's perfectly fine. But that's what, you know, and but you also have a, a very interesting part, which is what happens on the public internet, you know, on the, uh, you know, in the transit and up to, up to that, those edge points. Um, and I think you should make a clear distinction of what is what, because those are the numbers I think are, are you know, are very, very interesting and that we need to do something about. Um, and also extend the methodology to, to make you know, better measurements on that. Uh, my second point is that I actually did speak to one of the operators that you um, listed in your, your email, which uh -huh. I thought was very, very useful. And uh, you know, it might be a, a, you know, a wall of shame or, or not, but it's interesting to get their reasoning why things were as they were. Uh, and this operator filtered um, destination options header, routing header, and hop by hop header. Um, by the fact that I sent them an email and asked them, they removed the filter for destination options because that was a historical, you had some firewall at some point in time that you could easily tweak adding some pad options and, and you would you know, either fall on the floor or you get packets through. So they removed that one and they asked me, uh, so what do we want to do with these other ones? We can't filter on routing header type. Um, so we have, uh, and you know, the potentially some boxes that would fall over by hop by hop. I'm not, not very worried by hop by hop. But there's certainly, you know, having this, measurements and having it documented and actually document who does what, um, we have an opportunity to here to change behavior of these operators and at least understand why they're doing what they're doing. So was the goal. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think we've got Furry and then two at the back. Uh, so I should say that we might get a new version of the draft because I we might update it with another measurement result because currently in the draft we have Fernando's measurements which was done from like limited set of location, right? And I done measurements from distributed, like from 500 different slash 32s using RIPE Atlas. And my data kind of more optimistic than Fernanda has because for destination options for short one, eight bytes, more than 90% reached the, so 80% reach as a destination and destination replied, and more than 90% of dropped packets were dropped at destination. 
So basically, we do not see so much filtering uh, on the transit path, uh, on the intermediate ISS. And another interesting thing, I think we still should update the draft and probably discuss possible reasons for filtering. As it has been mentioned, yeah, it might be decision made by operator, or it might be hardware imitation, it might be something else. And what I'm seeing is that as soon as you increase the size of the extension header, they, the drop rate significantly increased and stayed the same. So basically, uh, almost everything, uh, almost every packet with extension header of 512 bytes are dropped, and it's no difference between 512 and 1K. So I assume uh, a big part of it is due hardware not being able to look deep enough, and this might change over time. And answering the previous comment about is it so is it okay to use extension header in private networks? I do hope that nobody reads the message of the draft as it's not okay to use extension header at all. There might be some connectivity issue currently, right? And we just want to document the experience, but I don't want to send the message. You should not, like, we should, don't even think about using them. Well, part of the, what we had in mind um, for this update was actually to try to make that point clear. Brett hit Brett us with that. Uh, so we tried, and actually after the previous meeting, I know that there were a a number of people that you know thought that that was the message and probably there was a language issue there that we were uh, so what we were conveying there was different from what we were meaning so but this update should probably be better in that respect yes yeah, so i like if someone still reads this draft as like don't use them at all we'd like to hear or we probably need to make the text even more clear then uh-huh okay erica um, medica Kayo. So a couple of comments. One thing, uh, we definitely do have to clear up the language because since the Hawaii meeting, I've heard a lot of uh, uh, different um, uh, interpretations of the intent of the document. So the intent is purely to have measurements to show whether or not there is extension headers that are dropped and then looking at the results, then determine is there anything that the IETF can actually do about it. Um, I also, uh, you know, there is a draft, I was actually co-author of it. it, it hasn't really gone anywhere which is operationally why, why operators actually drop specifically um, uh, fragmentation uh, extension headers. So, you know, maybe we should resurrect that or maybe incorporate some of that text into, into this particular work. Um, I also, you know, looking through the different threads on the list in this work, you know, I think that people are in favor of actually having the measurements, right, knowing exactly what the methodologies were so that we can accurately depict what is the state in the internet. Um, I'm also in favor of clarifying language. As I heard Mikhail talk about drop versus filter, I also, when I hear you know, drop packets, that could be because equipment does it by default or whatever was filtering. To me personally, I would take as intent, but that's a language issue, right? We can just say filter parentheses, not intentionally or no intent implied. So these are just language issues that can be clarified in the document, but I think the work is important. I think we've seen that on the list from a variety of operators, and so I would be in favor of it. So Eric. Eric Vink, um, I sent you a couple of comments on the mailing list, so I won't repeat it here. Um, indeed, refreshing the data is, would be very well done. It's a really, really important piece of work, so we should really push forward on this. Uh, the reality described, I don't like it, but hey, that's reality, what? So what can we do? Um, you should push this work as well to operators group, way more, because IATF uh, is a very nice place to discuss, but this is the operator, they do it on purpose. And finally, I'm pretty much in, in alignment with Michael. Um, filtering for me is an explicit action, while we, we name the title drops, we'll be fully fine with it. But good job again, right? So continue. Uh, two comments about that. Uh, when it comes to the word that we use, I mean, we did an implied intent, but if that is not clear, we can clarify in the next uh, revision of the ID. And when it comes to uh, taking that to the operators community, in fact, we did. I think uh, Jen presented that at um, right, right? Uh, I did the same thing at the Lagnog and Lagnog meetings, and we also posted like. Uh, uh, the ID on Nano uh, and presented a few times at IEPG. Yeah. Okay, super, thanks. So, Jenlinko, yes, I presented at the tribe, operational community. And again, we have to be very careful what we are saying because I got immediate response. Yeah, you see everyone filtering them and you're filtering them. So, 
let's forget about extension headers. And it's not a message I want uh -huh. to send out. Yeah, Lorenzo Colidi, uh, I, I, I would agree with the, the large number of people by now who have said um, this is not, this might be intent, it might not be intent. And we need to, we need to say here, if we can, um, that people may drop this stuff for very different reasons. Um, Ulu is saying content networks drop this stuff because they don't want the they don't want this in their service, and that's different from ISPs dropping this because they're transit, and they should be beholden to carry the packets. Well, content networks wouldn't want to drop this stuff, but like we have no choice. And until the last piece of hardware that doesn't support you know uh, filtering statelessly uh, goes away, uh, because you know our hardware can only look at the first extension header, then we have to drop this stuff, right? Any extension header, right? Our, our, our hardware can tell us this is, it can look at the first extension header um, type and, you know, that's all it can do, right? So it is completely unable to look at a TCP packet that's two extension headers in. Can I just ask you a question, Lorenzo? So why would you ever accept an extension header that you had no service sitting behind supporting? I mean, why would you have it would be like, why would you accept SCTP if you didn't have anything applied to SCTP behind that load balancer? Consider, consider, um, you know, something like Google Public DNS, which needs to be able to talk to external DNS servers that send replies that are DNS sec signed and therefore require fragmentation. Wouldn't it be nice if we didn't have to hack around that and we could just use the use the device's stateful firewalls, stateless firewalls, in the way that you know supports this? I think fragmentation is a part of the RP architecture, but more, you know, arbitrary, you know, routing headers, uh, various destination options that wouldn't make any sense to you unless you supported them, hop by hop options. Would there ever be a case where that would make sense unless your backend systems actually did something with those? Right, but right now we can't actually, we can't, we don't even have the option of making our backend systems support that because the packets will never arrive. So, yeah. so uh, that's what I'm saying. I think we, we kind of, a lot of us agree on this, it seems, that we, we do need to say, look, you know, some of this is just unavoidable due to hardware limitations. And, the, you know, these are the reasons. And what happened to Ron's draft where he said, you must look, you must be able to look, you know, this many bytes into the packet. Yeah, Joel Yegley. Um, so, I mean, my particular experience with that is, um, you know, I have, various kinds of hashing problems and one of them is is that if I can't find that L4 header again then it's going to hash to a different server and the result of that is like uh, even if I didn't drop it it's no good to anybody so uh, yeah 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 I mean yes there's a small but non-zero probability that it will actually arrive at the correct server so if you do it enough times like maybe try it sending several million packets maybe you'll get one Yeah, I think Ole made a very good point that a part of the problem is that uh, uh, only packets which are required for service to run are permitted, right? So there's no service using destination options that, yeah, they might be dropped. Actually, it means that situation is even better than I saw because if like about 80% of destination options reached the destination, uh, packet with destination option reach the destination and I got a reply, and there is nothing on that side using this option. That might be if we start using it somehow, it's gonna be better. It's like IPv6, it's like chicken and egg problem, right? We, we cannot use it because there is connectivity issues and there are connectivity issues because nobody's using it. So yeah, there is some brokenness in the network, but I do hope it could be improved over time. So Ulit, one last uh, comment. So the provider I spoke to was a transit provider. And I find that much more troubling that they are filtering because that there's no very good reason. Because for that, that is intent, if they know about with, it. You know. With intent, yes. Um, but they are willing to engage in the conversation, so we'll see what comes out of that. So that's why I'm, you know, I'm very supportive of this work, and I would support adoption, but with a very, very strong caveat that this document doesn't say 
what it says now, which is essentially you can't use extension headers on the internet. And I do not, I, I mean, I, you know, with the six man, man share on as well, I mean, that is not a message we want to send. And I understand that's not necessarily the intent of the document, right? But that's very, very easy to read it that way, which, uh, um, so I, I think we would, I would really like us to change that so that wasn't the reading people would get out of it before we adopted it. Um, but that's yeah, like any, uh, the, any specific part that you think obey that message, just let us know. I mean, that's not the intent, so that's what I'm saying. I think the lack of any messaging saying that this is an undesirable situation is what Ule is complaining about. I think Ule would like to see, you know, some text, I imagine some text that says, this is bad, and you know, it- That, you know, that this is reporting an error. Yeah, it, it's basically, th this draft is <clears throat> attempting to measure an, unfor an unfortunate state of affairs, which is a bad thing, and which we are trying to fix. Yes, so, so so Yeah, I, I wanna address this comment, because uh, uh, Fernando had specifically asked me to take a look at the draft, and those are specifically the language issues that I'm trying to address and help with because that is not the intent. I can see how some of the intent could have been implied. So we are actually working on the language to show that this is purely for measurement. This, you know, this does not imply that extension headers should not be used or you know, that they should be dropped. And so you know, we are addressing this. But I think some of the numbers and the way they're presented today can be used by operators to justify, well, everyone else is dropping them, so I'll do that too. And then that cat is out of the bag, it's just like, we do in the forwarding part for V4. Is it zero X45? Fine, if not, we drop it. And that was like the options gone. Okay, so let, let me try to summarize and bring this to some closure. Um, we've had several comments about intent and filter and drop. May I suggest that you, you just globally replace filter with drop? Um, I, I think that'll clarify that. And it sounds like we need an additional sentence or two that talks about the intent of the draft uh, and, and the fact that this is an unfortunate situation mm -hmm. in process being fixed. Um, are people are, are okay with that model and anybody have additional thoughts there? Okay. Um, it, so the question that, that you've raised and showing on the slide here is, Bob, yeah, I actually, <clears throat> sorry, Bob Hinden suggests that maybe the draft actually talks about why in each case, what, what happens, what's the bad thing about dropping these headers and be very explicit about it. Talk about the problems it causes, not just the, this, just, not just the number that are being dropped. I mean, we, we, I think we have a bigger problem with path MTU discovery, but this sort of is in the same category. So, so you'd like to expand that sentence or two to talk about? Right. We we actually want the network. Yeah. Security. What what are legitimate uses uses for these headers, and by dropping them, you <coughs> break this. Okay. Uh, Lorenzo Pilidi, in my experience, that's actually counterproductive. Uh, when you tell an operator exactly what breaks, they say, oh, "We don't support any of that," and they say, "Like we're fine to drop it." Um, instead, you need to create. Um, a situation where, uh, for example, uh, the breakage might be unknown, in which case, um, or future, or you know, in which case somebody says, oh yeah, but I don't understand this. Maybe it's gonna break in the future. Let me, yeah, let me do what the document says. So um, I, I don't know that, uh, because the, the, the fact that these extension headers are being dropped today and the world keeps on turning already by itself might suggest to such an operator that there's no problem. Right, so uh, we need to we we need to sort of if we do enumerate problems, we should make sure that they are uh, concerning enough and unknown enough and scary enough that you know somebody does something. Okay, cool. So the the remaining question before the house on this draft is, do we want to adopt it as a working group item? Um, so that that's a binary question. Let me take two humps. If you want to take it as a working group item, please hump. If you do not want to, please hump. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So we, we then have one other thing that Merica brought up from the back of the mic, which is the fragment drop uh, draft. Uh, Warren has brought that up a couple of times. Uh, do you want them to bring that back to the working group for discussion, Merica? I have a comment. I was just typing to Jen's comment because, you know, listening and typing at the same time is kind of hard. But um, uh, my recommendation actually is that resurrection of that document is more to look at the text and possibly bring that into this document because that document is specific to only dropping fragmentation headers. And so, you know, that needs to be looked at. But I would recommend that we at least look at all the work that was done there and see whether or not to extend that to all kinds of extension headers while they're dropped and having a separate operational document as to why. why as opposed bring, to bringing it into this draft. Yeah. And but, but, while but I, an agreement on my yeah. part, I wouldn't want to bring that into this draft. But uh, my question for the assembled crowd is, do you want to resurrect that draft and discuss that? So, uh, Lorenzo? As I think one of the authors of that draft, we got hit by so much flack when we presented it that, I mean, I... I <laughs> You're not inclined to do that. No. <laughs> I, okay. So um, it was, we got um, substantially more criticism than this draft is encountering for the same reasons, uh, even though we thought we were just presenting uh, a situation and I think what is saving this document from that barrage of criticism is that it actually provides data which nobody can argue with, which we didn't have. Uh, we just referred to third party data. But I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion if we put it in here or keep, resurrect the other one. It's probably, maybe it's better to keep it in here you know, so that we only have to deal with one document. Regarding the formatting there, I think uh, Fernando's draft, the main value is that it pro provides a measurement methodology and the result of the measurement. And there is value in that because if the measurement methodology is out there, plenty of people can use it. Uh, like, for example, in the US, the FCC can use it to measure neutral network neutrality issues and uh, all kinds of applications like that. So it has value per se. And I would be a bit reluctant to have the, this is how we measure it and this is what you find, commingled with pronouncement about what is desirable and what is not. Well, I think the question of what was desirable or what wasn't is that people are finding in the document and what I found in the previous version of the document yeah. was a, an explicit recommendation. As a result, don't use extension headers. Um, and because of that confusion, uh, there, there was a call to say, we're not trying to say that. Yeah, I, I th yes, and that's a way of being neutral, and mm -hmm. I understand that, and say basically the, the result of those, this state of affairs is that people will observe unreliable results, and that should be fixed by fixing the problem, not necessarily fixing the solution. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Lorenzo I, I, I think, I do think, um, you know, the charter is that we provide operational guidance, not that we do measurements. Um, so I think we should do that. Okay, so what working group is chartered to do measurements? The ACM, various research organizations, the RIPE, you know, RIPE NCC has a research arm, you know, um, so what I hear you saying is that Fernando should now send this to the ISC. No, I think it's fine here. I think we should say, here's what we found. And we, you know, this, these are the operational reasons we think people are doing this for. And, you know, by the way, this is, you know, we would like for people not to do this because it sort of it limits our ability to innovate in the long run. And we recommend that, that operators check that if they don't have um, strong reasons to do this, they consider their policies and they stop doing this filter. Okay, but um, I, thinking somewhat academically here, it seems like a report of the data and a report of the recommendations and conclusions resulting from the data are two separate statements. Um, if, if that were true, I would argue if that were true, 
our graph wouldn't have, wouldn't have been targeted by you know nuclear attacks, right? The one where we said operators drop fragments, it was you know it was a carnage, right? <laughs> and that's because people had exactly this concern. Uh, we can't, as a as an operational guidance working group, provide a statement on what is happening uh, because it what is happening is bad and we should feel bad and we should try to stop it. So that you know that's what. <laughs> So maybe our opinion of cha has changed and we're okay with publishing this. I do hear, you know, noise from six man that, you know, we should make a statement here. And so, so I don't know if that. Okay, Joel. No, I, I think you said you should, I think what you said was we should make a statement that this is bad. Is that right? Of course, what I said in my own head and what actually came out of my mouth is not the same thing. But um, what I tried to say is that we should not make a statement that could in any way just if people that people could use to justify dropping extension headers. We agree on that. And, and a zero and a zero statement that would say nothing also says that, right? Would you prefer to have a statement that says we expect packets with extension headers to be passed, which is different than saying dropping them is bad. It's just saying this is the expectation because the protocol exists and is used. Good. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, friendly neighborhood AD here. I, I think it's good for us to channel what we would like to have happen, right? I mean, if, if, you, if, you, if you don't, I mean, it, you know, I, I think this is not while while the while we have questions as to whether the text should be valued neutral or not with respect to you know you're a bad person and you're doing a bad thing. I think I think there's more I think there's more utility in a statement that says that you know we are the IETF and we see this as a problem, right? And that's a useful thing to include along with the data and. You know, um, so I, I think I think capturing what you want to have happen as part of you know um, measurement is I think important, right? Because you start you have to start somewhere, and um, part of that is you know an expectation of how things are supposed to work and a hypothesis, you know, um, that caused you to go out and collect the data. So. I, I'm, I'm detecting some circular behavior here. We actually talked about adding that paragraph earlier, and we all agreed to that. Yep. So, what are we talking about? Yeah, I think we're okay with that. Okay. I'm, 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 I. My impression is is that this discussion has, is relatively convergent, and we can probably. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it, to that point, Jared, you made a face a minute ago. Did you want to make that face at the mic? Seeing no further discussion, I believe we've heard consensus that we're going to adopt it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No. You have a slide with the title. <laughs> All right, uh, Ed Lewis. Uh, my intent up here is to talk about a draft that was put out to the list, got some discussion, and after... I have to stay in the box. Uh, so, so I submitted a draft, um, middle of February. There was about five days of discussion on the list, pretty intense. Uh, after that, those of us behind the draft did some more investigation, decided to kind of abandon the idea. And so this is mostly to talk about why we've, at least for now, abandoned the idea. Uh, so I'm not looking for adoption or anything like that. This is about, you know, we want to go away from this thing. So, so the draft that is in question is the loopback prefix, and I apologize for the name being kind of mangled. Uh, I won't go into that. Uh, but the idea was, can we get more loopback addresses in V6? And the rationale for this was, I have a use case, and the use case is solved in IPv4 a certain way, so why can't we do that in V6? That's kind of the premise for all of this. 
And we did V4 is we took an, an, an IP address, which had two, we wanted two properties. One was you would never send a packet out or of the node or for whatever appropriate terminology you want to use. It would go nowhere. You wouldn't go there. And if you went somewhere, you'd not get to where you wanted to go. Uh, we wanted to cause a break in that connection for a certain reason. Two, we wanted an address that would make people say, what is this? And do a web search and find out there's a whole lot of reasons why you got this address. So people who don't know what they're doing, go nowhere, don't lose data, and then we'll go and find out why they, what they need to do to fix their stuff. So in V4, we could do this. We had plenty of V4, we had plenty of loopback addresses. In V6, we don't have that option. So we thought, well, great, we'll just get more V6 at loopback addresses and that should solve the problem. So we put an idea out there. Uh, first thing we ran into was someone had previously done the same attempt about a year and a half earlier, and that went nowhere too. Bad precedent. I read through that. I realized that there was a point, there was a reason why it kind of went went nowhere ultimately. Uh, so we thought, well, what, well, maybe there are some other reasons. What other use cases are there? Our use case is kind of a small thing. It's not necessarily ch worth changing the world for. But what about the other ones? So we looked around, and there were two use cases we had in mind. One was... Back in the old days, we would run lots of uh, IP addresses on loopback so we could have many servers of DNS, that's our favorite area, um, all on port 53 and so they could talk to each other. So we thought, well, great, what, what if you want to do that? What if you want to have multiple services, the same port number, same machine for, for, for education purposes, for talking, if you don't have a network, you want to demonstrate things or testing, whatever. Uh, ran into the fact that in V6, you don't need to do that. You don't need loopback addresses. We have link local on the on loopback interface and that works just as well. That's one thing. People said you can also use virtual machines these days. So it's actually interesting to see that this is a place where the world has moved on from what V4 wanted to, into V6. You don't really want to replicate the V4 stuff into V6. It kind of tore away that, that, that one reason. Uh, the next thing that came along was we observed that there were the DNS black and white lists, the RC 5782 uh, that was written five years ago, where people will put into the DNS uh, information about whether or not you want to basically accept spam or not accept spam from or mail from people. Uh, so I talked to the author about that and got a little more background on what were they thinking because the draft that RFC is pretty clear, the operational practice are pretty clear. But the, the, the thing in there is the basic thing that is it, it's like you're being in on a joke. When you do the lookup to them to this these type of lists and you're going to get back an A record, an IPv4 address record with a with 32 bit value in it you know that that is not an address. It's a token. You know that it's going to mean something other than go to that address. Right? Okay. So for in this case, do they want V6? No, they don't care. They just want to have a 32-bit number they can send back to you and you go off and just know not to take mail or send mail or whatever. Um, and I know there's debate about whether that's a good use, overloading the, I'm not getting into that, but the idea there is everyone's in on the joke. In our use case, people aren't in on the joke. So we can't count on that. People don't know when they get this address that it's funny. So uh, there was no common interest in that area there. Uh, and I believe that kind of covers the two other cases, the, the multiple um, servers on the same host and these, these block lists and the way they were using or reusing the 32-bit address in, the, in an A record. And we realized after that that we were kind of alone. We didn't have any other uh, applications that wanted to do what they did in V4 and V6. And so we went back and said, well, so increasing the loopback address space, given that it's been tried, it's failed, uh, and it's probably not necessary, we just kind of dropped it at that point. And uh, what we didn't do is we didn't say that the list, we give up. We just stopped discussing. Looking at the list discussion, we just stopped. We had maybe a few more days discussion in the office, and we decided to, to kind of walk away with it. And then I totally forgot about this until I got the mail that I'm on the agenda today. Uh, so uh, I'll open up for questions. Wes George, um, our, there is another use case, um, RFC 7439, the um, IPv6 MPLS gap analysis. Um, in section 342, there is a discussion about the need for a range of loopback addresses in order to do MPLS ping on v6. Um, we had made reference to the previous version of the more loopback addresses draft that was floating around um, last year, I think. And um, this is still an outstanding problem. Now, it's not necessarily the only way to solve it, but if you're looking for additional use cases to justify why this might still be useful to have, um, please make sure you're considering that one.
Okay, actually, that's, that's actually what I wanted to do in this presentation. It's not to say that we decided it's terribly in the way that we abandoned it because we didn't have any more cases. So uh, uh, please, please remind me, um, email or something about that so I can take a look at it. Um, I'm willing, if there is other reasons to go forward with this, I'm willing to consider them. But right now, I can't run out of ideas. Um, yeah, so for the record, I'm sad to see this go. Um, it seems mildly useful, totally harmless. And it seems to me that the attacks on the, on the list were attacks on what people use the uses things in V4 for, which are, I think, misplaced. Um, it's true that people use the V4 loopback space for things that should never be done because they're obviously wrong. And I think we need to live with that. I mean, it's, we, we can't fix everything that goes on. Um, link local addresses are not a good substitute because they require changes to code, okay? Because you, you have to be able to, you know, you have to be able to specify the scope ID. You need to know what scope ID is. You can't know what the loopback interface is called in advance because the name varies between from system to system and so on and so on. You can use ULA, but that's not the same for everyone. I, I, I do see the value in this, um, but, you know, I'm not about to sort of suggest to you that you keep fighting the relentless opposition uh, because it may not end up being a good use of your time. I am not part of the opposition, for that's worth. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind too. Uh, it, I, I'm not. I'm not. You know, if this comes back to the point where there is, it's worth pursuing this just for the purpose of of achieving this. Then we'll come back to it. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it's completely dead. But you're, 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 what you do, what you said, or I understand. I understand. I, I did have another use case. Sorry, before I sit down. Um, unit tests. We use we, you know, we use multiple before addresses per unit test, and we can't do that. And in IPv6, and you know that that's I think again that's perfectly legitimate. Okay. Hey, Mark. Um, Lorenzo, where do unit tests in name D? We use ULA. Yeah, my unit tests don't run as root. Mine do. <laughs> yeah, you know shared machines and all that. Okay, so, so I'll go back and I'll look at some of the more use cases. If there if there seems to be a, another motivation, another good way to go forward, we'll come back to it. But right now, uh, for the, the use case I had in mind, my motivation, my selfish motivation, we're still trying to figure out what we're going to do about it. Um, but I will, we will take this into consideration and we, we may come back because part of the motivation was we thought it was a good general solution out there, not just to solve our stuff. So we'll look back at that. Okay. <laughs> so, great. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, no, error has been here. For a while, I was afraid that I'd be nutted from a Dutch name to a Chinese name, but no, I'm still there. Okay, anyway, uh, a quick one. A quick one. Simply because I run, I'm actually a couple of my um, friends doing content in Belgium made and found a big problem and they wanted to move to dual stack. And I think it needs to be documented. So quickly, uh, a refresh for you. You know that HTTP is stateless, so everything that you need to go for a long-term transaction, like e-shopping or whatever, basically use the term cookies, basically to store some state into a backend database. Pretty obvious. How it works, for instance, you have John Doe on the left, the server on the right is simply sending its credential first. If this thing wants to move. Yeah. So it's sending the credential. Credential are checked. The state is inserted in the database and the cookie generated. That's basically, as you know, a random number, which is used in an index into the database. So now I store the cookie in my cookie jar and I want to buy something called foo. I am sending on an HTTP connection. Hey, I want to buy foo, here's my cookies. You check into the cookie jar on the server side. You say, yes, this cookie exists. It has been validated. The user is authorized. I'm heading to this card, basically a device foo. And, and so I want to buy something called bar. 
Same thing I'm sending into another HTTP transaction. I want to buy a bar, is my cookie. Cookie is used an index on the server. Identify, yes, this guy exists, is authorized, I'm adding, uh, is buying bar to the card. Pretty simple, right? Uh, it has been working for many, many times and many, many years. Now, comes two things. CGN, they do not respect this RSC 6888, which basically every time you go to the CGN, you may end up into another IPv4 address public. Okay? And there is also API board where one transaction can start with IPv6 and the other one could be over IPv4 because something changed the network. So, again, right, not, not rocket science. So we start the thing. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at John Doe. Here's my credential. And I give you a cookie. Now, the fact is that for some security reason, and they could be valid, to be honest, because cookie can be stolen by some JavaScript. And as soon as you store the cookie of somebody, you can impersonate him. You can appear like him and get all his credentials and everything. So <clears throat> some server basically put into the cookie jar on the, center, on the server, they put the IP address of the user as a check. Okay, and every time you come back, not only on, we check the cookie, but we check whether the source IP address is the same for security. So now, John Doe now has another address. Again, it could be a bad CGN, could be API ball, could be going from 3G uh, to Wi-Fi, for instance, multiple use case, by the way. So now, when he start to read foo and he's sending the cookie, the server will check the cookie to say, oh yes, this cookie exists. Um, it is a shopping cart, but the address is not the right one. So basically, I'm getting down, you said, you are not authorized. And basically you, basically you break the complete e-shopping session. So, and two example in my own country. So, and just to tell you how very unnerving and annoying this stuff is, I'm from Belgium where we have about 30% of IPv6, but little content. And we've got banks, for instance, on newspaper that want to do to move to V6, but then they are facing this issue. So in this case, this is Dutch from a Belgian bank that says basically have a technique, right? Security issue, it's pretty clear. And the other one, this one is in French, because as you know, we have two languages in Belgium. They simply say you're being disconnected because the cookie is not more recognized. And that's what I said. That's really annoying because service providers, content provider, when they do their small home test, you know, with WW6 or something, everything works. They start production, it works, and then we get a couple of users having problems because they do a PI board and they start V4 and V6 and the cookie is no more uh, respected there. And it takes a time for InfoSec to be convinced. So basically, but InfoSec enforce the fact that we need to check the IP address of the cookie, and I fully support this idea, to be honest. So what do we do for this provider? Basically, they move completely to IPv4. They refuse to do the US type. So the, <coughs> sorry, not really sure we can do anything there, except education. And that's even if Brian Draft, uh, Brian RFC, sorry, 6883 talks about this, but you write it into to one uh, sentence, one big sentence, it could be worth to have a draft, maybe not an RFC, of course, a draft explaining this so that people are not surprised. And that's basically the, the purpose of this. Um, and I wanted to present it to you so that you know about it. I'm not sure what to do with this document. I mean, I can still update it if there are comments. Uh, not really sure whether it's worth to become a working group item, and not even sure whether it's worth to become an, an international RFC. So comments are welcome there. I told you it was short. Yeah. Um, Alex Petrescu. So um, I wonder whether this is not an HTTP problem or maybe a uh, certificate using IPv6 address instead of IPv4 address problem. Let me tell you why I'm saying this. Uh, because uh, in Luxembourg, which is near Belgium, um, they use uh, this token. 
and uh, it's IPv4 only. Maybe if they make it IPv6, it will solve your cookie problem. It's what I'm password. I'm not, not even sure though, because that's not linked to the auto first authentication, because the word authentication is done by password, one time token or whatever. You don't care. This is the backend system that relies on a cookie for authenticating to prove that the session has been authenticated. Yeah, but a cookie authentication is weak. We, I think that is already known. I think banks should move away from cookies uh, from, from a start, right? Yeah, we can talk about it. I I'm not an application person anyway, right? So, but I see the problem there. Uh, this is Brian. I just wanted to clarify specifically the issue that 6883 worries about is uh, rapidly rotating privacy addresses because that is absolutely guaranteed to create this problem you know the the other cases could be rare but that one if someone is running rapidly rotating privacy addresses the, the problem is guaranteed yeah there's another case indeed yes uh dave taylor so it seems like there's actually uh two different problems that you're talking about um one is the problem that uh applications are keeping uh, IP address state in between sessions. The other one is the fact that you have um, non-RFC compliant things like CGNs that are out there. Those are two different problems that are really in scope for discussion in two different areas of the IETF. And so that's, uh, it, it sounds like you're kind of coming to that same conclusion yourself, but um, in terms of, is there anything for this working group to do? Well, we could do an RFC that says be RFC compliant, but that seems to be a bit circular. Um, the other one, um, is just good guidance that says, yes, application layer protocol shouldn't keep IP address state in between uh, sessions. Uh, that would be a good thing to say, although maybe it's not entirely different from um, the uh, Brian Carpenter's uh, RFC that uh, says uh, things should use names, not addresses, and name doesn't necessarily mean DNS name, it means some higher level state or whatever. Um, and so that's not specific to HTTP, it's just you ran into it with HTTP, but you're right, it's, it's generalizable. Um, and so I think that's why the apps discuss discussion was probably relevant because it may not be that style of guidance isn't specific to HTTP, um, but who knows what other uh, assumptions people are putting in now that they shouldn't be and bringing this to people's attention is a good thing. So the apps discuss thing is a good thing and I don't, if nobody is responding on that, then I don't know what to do, but um, I think that's where the guidance is if, I don't know what this working group would do other than saying, yeah, you're right, right? People shouldn't do that. Then people should actually be doing RFC compliant CGNs and, and, and doing things the way that we've already provided guidance, so. Yeah, uh, Christian Wittema, I mean, they, they, they've pointed at the, the crux of the issue is that uh, A, from an operational point of view, we should not change the addresses too soon, clearly. And B, I mean, relying on the IP address as an authentication token is a truly bad idea. Now there's a C, is that your banking customers should really get a copy of Fireship. A copy of what? Fireship. Can you explain because? Well, that authentication pattern that you describe mm -hmm. is known to be broken because effectively it has one secure phase in which you get a cookie and then some insecure phase in which you merely repeat the cookie. And so if anyone gets a copy of your packet in between, they steal the transaction. And Fireship is an implementation of this stealing. So they should really not be doing that. And that's a reason why I, I would be reluctant to take that particular example, which is a really poor security practice, as a justification for a recommendation to the or the working group. Okay. And indeed, Fireship was a nice push for Facebook and others to move to SSL yeah. transaction. Yeah. I remember that. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. So now, Shane Jones. Okay, I hope the quick. There's only two pages of uh, my slides. Yeah, you need to be a little closer to the mic. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I'll leave the uh, background here. Um, 
actually, um, you know, IPv6 allows the, you know, uh, multiple prefix, prefix in a single network. So, but this is, you know, a very surprise or un expected by uh, many of the uh, you know, network operators, either for carrier networks or enterprise networks. So really, uh, there are some educations uh, to them are desired. Um, so that's the original um, motivation of our draft. Um, this draft already uh, present um, twice in uh, the working group, but uh, um, we received some pushback because originally we had the draft content, you know, not only in the background of multiple profits, uh, but also the operational considerations and problem statements for, for you know, further standardized work, how to, you know, fix some uh, operational issues in uh, one running multiple profits. But we get pushback for that part of the contents because you know people already uh, IETF is already in action to uh, fix that uh, um, you know those problems and they are uh, lying um, various uh, working groups. So there's no much point to uh, you know get the problem statement there and also the operational considerations um, may you know. Um, not be uh, very a uh, consensus there because um, you know different uh, operators may have different uh, uh, requirements and may have different operations. Um, so at the end, we seem to reach the consensus that uh, you know people only want the technical background that help and that has some you know. Uh, additional um, uh, material for the you know, new IPv6 uh, network of Twitter to start with. That's how we, we get the current form now. Uh, this slide shows plan to update um, because this slide um, was made last week, but we actually already upload a new version yesterday night. So I, I, I don't think many of you uh, uh, already read that. Uh, but this is what we already did, is we narrow the scope to be only background information for multiple projects in IPv6 networks. And we remove the guidance contents, um, problem statements already removed uh, in last uh, update. Uh, we also remove the, uh, um, uh, 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 the drafts um, because they are not officially published in um, RFC yet. So um, some people say that's not very good for uh, background in documents. Um, but however, six of the, those drafts were actually uh, rich work group drafts already. So they probably get published before, you know, uh, we reach the publication. Um, I mean, if we may. Um, so, here, here we are, the um, background documents for multiple prefix. So now that's the question for the working group. Does the working group want to publish a background document on this topic? Uh, does that help for uh, operators? Comments? <coughs> Yes, I think it would be really nice to t let people what kind of problems they are going to face, new problems which we which they didn't have in before when they're running multiple prefixes. So I have one comment on the content of the document. I just I read it just yesterday. You do uh, discuss uh, router selection, exit router selection. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is one related problem which I think should be explicitly mentioned is the situation when you have more than one router, more than one prefix and one router fails, how can you signal this to the host? I know like HomeNet is doing work on this, yeah, but it's uh, one of the problem people should be aware of, especially if they're using 
non-home net solution work mm -hmm. as a vendors, right? Your, uh, your device has two prefixes and suddenly because of operators using BC, hopefully deploying BCP search aid, you could not use your preferred address right now. Okay. So probably it would be nice to keep mentions this to mm -hmm. how you are going to implement this. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Brian Carpenter. Um, from talking to site or enterprise network managers of my acquaintance and thinking about my own psychology when I was a site network manager, um, I think this aspect of IPv6 is going to be one of the really big surprises for the people who haven't yet started seriously thinking about IPv6. Right. So I think it's actually a little bit unfortunate if the document comes off across as saying, in IPv6 you get all these new problems due to multiple prefixes. Uh, it would be much nicer if it said, in IPv6 you get all these benefits from multiple pre prefixes, but at least it should be neutral rather than being something that will make a, a, a typical IT manager or chief information officer look at it and say, oh, I don't like that. <laughs> Okay. And I, I don't quite know how to achieve that, but the danger in this document is that it produces exactly the opposite of the desired effect. Yeah, thanks. We, we can, you know, mix up here. Okay, yeah, yeah. I don't think I agree. It's a very good point. So probably you should uh, phrase it as design considerations, what you should think, um, what you should, talk, you should talk to your vendors, for example, about, and so on, right? Um, yeah, th that's, you know... So probably, yeah, we probably shouldn't say problems, but some new design considerations. Okay, uh, could be. Um, yeah. Um, is Lauren here? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, um, that's, that's what we tried to do, uh, you know, previously. Um, uh, as I said, we already removed problem statement. Um, but... I'm not really sure how much, you know, consideration or recommendation we can give in, in a document because, you know, um, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm not the, you know, site network manager. So um, we may, you know, if we get, but, the, you know, there are few uh, site network manager attend IDF. So uh, really, I, I don't, you know, sure we, whether we can give, you know, good recommendations without, you know, actually running the, the, such kind of networks. Barbara Stark. Um, one of the things I see is that solutions for handling of multiple prefixes are still being developed yep. and some are still years away. and. You can't reference them because they're not done. Yeah. Um, so this is incomplete at this time because the solutions aren't there. And I don't know how useful that is. And I'd rather focus on getting the solutions created. Um, but, but, you know, we are encouraged people to deploy IPv6, but uh, they should know what is already you know, available. Uh, even more solutions coming or even problems are there, but those, you know, network managers should know it, should know what's the kind of situation. Uh, that's the purpose. E, yeah, Joel Yigley. Um, so I've run this kind of network and I see other people in the room who have, so I'm not sure that we can characterize it as um, those people aren't here. We would like to get you know more help, more information. So I guess the 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 question is, uh, do, do we want to work on this? Is this is this class of document something that this working group wants to come up with? Um, let me put that as a binary question, and it's probably a degree, but uh, let me put that as a binary question. Do you, if you want uh, Shang Zhang and his uh, collaborators to continue with the documents, 
and and take it in the direction that he's outlined in this hump. Um, please hump. If not, please hump. Okay, so that's actually fairly clear. Um, so, okay. Yeah, okay, okay, great, thank you. So with that, we've come to the end of the agenda. We have half an hour left. Um, do we have other things that just we in the room would like to discuss? If not, I'm going to send you out to the foyer. Seeing people running to the foyer. Uh, okay, so we're, we're adjourned. Looking for a blue sheet? Yeah. Well, so, so the one bright line that crosses is that we have to be proposing it. If you're happy, I'm happy. So, by the way, did the clicker go out? Well, yeah, so for, for the next meeting, I can imagine.